Coming up on Theater Talk. He ran on cocaine and adrenaline, and he yeah. was just this bundle of energy, always, always. And he became a recluse for two years. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. Alan Carr was a flamboyant, colorful Broadway and Hollywood producer. He was famous, of course, for producing the hit movie Grease. And on Broadway, he did La Cage aux Folles. It all crashed when he did a notorious Oscar ceremony in which uh, Rob Lowe appeared with Snow White, uh, one of the more memorable Oscar moments. Uh, he had a fascinating life, and he is the subject of a terrific new book called Party Animals, a Hollywood tale of sex, drugs, and rock and roll by our good friend Robert Hoffler, who has been the longtime theater and uh, uh, film correspondent for Variety and the author of another terrific book about Rock Hudson, or rather the agent who created Rock Hudson's career, and that book was called The Man Who Invented Rock Hudson. Uh, Bob Hoffler, welcome back to Theater Talk. Okay. Thanks for having me again. Um, all right, before we get into Alan Carr's life, mm -hmm. you got to tell us about Alan Carr's parties. Now, the parties he threw in Hollywood are notorious to this day. What were they like? Uh, well, the book uh, essentially starts in 1973, and that's when he bought Hillhaven Lodge, which was owned by Ingrid Bergman. And he was a manager, uh, you know, Anne Margaret, Tony Curtis, Melina McCauley. Um, Real old uh, school kind of stars that he liked. Uh, Diane Cannon. Uh, well, it was 1973, yeah. so Anne Margaret was certainly, uh, you know, very current. And uh, also he had Marvin Hamlish around that time, and that was his triple Oscar win. Uh, but he gave these wild parties, and certainly there were other A-list events that Bob Evans gave or Sue Mengers gave, but those were strictly A-list. Uh, Alan really mixed it up at his parties, and he was the first one to bring rock and roll stars like Elton John and Rod Stewart into that Hollywood mix of actors. Mm -hmm. He also had a real respect for old Hollywood, so you would go to these parties and Mae West might be there or Salvador Dali or Jack Benny. So they'd be sitting next to Alice Cooper and <laughs> sitting next to, you know, the good looking pool boy. You there know, were a lot of good looking pool boys. Well, yes, around. that was the essence of the good looking and pool boys. <laughs> that was a lot of it, you know, that you would go to Allen's and there was all the cocaine you wanted and there was all the, you know, sexual conquest that you wanted because, you know, unlike other A list parties, he would have good looking young men and women at these parties. And uh, this simply had not been done before. He also took a concept, I think, from the 60s, what we remember as happenings, which were kind of theatrical events that took place in odd places like, you know, a school or a vacant lot. And so uh, for the Tommy party, the premiere, of which he did not produce Tommy, that was Robert Stigwood, but right. Alan was the promoter, he staged the party in the subway at 57th and 6th. Mm -hmm. So people left the Ziegfeld Theater and walked up a red carpet and down and into the subway. the subway, and here was <laughs> Anne Margaret and Elton John and Tina Turner, and people thought this was a goof. Right. Uh, did he have a discotheque in his house? And, then and in 78, around the time that he had Greece, he spent $100,000 to do this Egyptian discotheque in this tiny room, and Brett Ratner, uh, the director, uh, bought the house, and actually the book starts when Brett Ratner first sees the house, and Brett Ratner is going through the house, and there's all this Alan Carr memorabilia, and there's all this um, memorabilia of Ingrid Bergman, and he goes down into the basement, and here is this, uh, you know, disco still <laughs> intact, which was legendary, mm -hmm. but hadn't been used for at least 15 years because Alan was a recluse the last 10 years of his life. Mm -hmm. But it was this wild, you know, discotheque. And uh, you've been to the house that Ratner Ratner owns now. Is oh the yeah, discotheque no, Brett still? Ratner gave me, oh yeah, no, no, no. The discotheque he, still in working absolutely, order. Absolutely, and he refurbished it. But Brett Ratner had better, much better taste than Alan Carr, which didn't take much, and <laughs> um, you know, really returned the house to what it looked like in Ingrid Bergman's day. And of course it was very interesting because Ingrid Bergman lived in the house and her husband, uh, Dr. Lindstrom, invited Roberto uh, Rossellini to be a guest and it was in the stone cottage which is still on the grounds where that affair started. Oh, so, 
you know, Alan had these, you, you, you would have the, the, the parties that the big celebs in the press showed up for. Right. There was also a Rolodex party where A through L, if your name was A through L, you showed up on Friday night and on Saturday night, you know, the M through Z. And Roman <laughs> Polanski during the, you know, rape trial showed up and that made it this scandal because he shouldn't have been at an Alan Carr party while he was on <laughs> <Just> <laughs> <for> <laughs> rape. rape. But he also had these private parties and, you know, it was intriguing to me. This is the kind of stuff that you know you can't make up as a novelist <laughs> that where this affair started between Ingrid Bergman and Roberto Rossellini is where these orgies were when Nuriev came to town and there would be a line of 25 guys out and uh, out in front of the, the stone house to service Nuriev. Wasn't uh, that called the mattress party? It was called the mattress party because <laughs> you were supposed to bring a mattress because <laughs> Alan also liked to watch young guys wrestle. But it, <laughs> <laughs> so they had mattresses in the living room, but also Dominic Dunn told me that uh, Alan had hired a hustler for every room in the house so that Nuriev could be serviced on the spot because he was sexually insatiable, but he never got around to using any of those guys, although other people did, you know, because he had already set up camp in, you know, the And his dad's stone card college. was full. In the stone cottage. <laughs> well, so it, then it goes without saying that uh, Alan Carr was a, a gay man openly so at a time when it was not as accepted and very flamboyant. It's, it's intriguing about the 70s, and I think for gay people it's a misunderstood decade because you think, oh, there was Harvey Milk. Well, who was Harvey Milk? Harvey Milk was not a major politician. But uh, someone like Alan Carr, who was, you know, this producer of Greece and, you know, this major manager, he was completely out there. And other people, you know, the David Geffens of the world or whatever, and... Uh, yeah. Uh, certainly were not out and you know some of these people still aren't but Alan pulled that off because he was this anti-main character yeah. you know he was the court jester and in a way know, he had he no choice hands and you have a wonderful picture of him as a which I'm showing now of him as yeah. a child that he was always this obese very open to himself gay boy and he really had no choice but to be that person well I think it's interesting with gay people that photograph of him where he has his Cub Scout yeah. cap on you can tell his parents were like join Cub Scouts and we'll make a man out of you but he's, stri <laughs> but he's striking a showgirl pose right, because right. that's what he wants yeah. if you look at photographs and then in high school he's the nerd he's very kind of withdrawn so you can see at some point even though no, someone had to take that photograph <laughs> and keep it uh, probably a parent or someone said, you know, this just isn't acceptable. And you can see this inwardness. It, it's great doing a biography and how much you learn from photographs, if you see a lot of them. But in college, he was called Poopsie, and he had his own column. He was the theater critic. Yes, at he Lake gave Forest College, Poopsie. which yeah. was not very, very liber liberal. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, he was, and he was already then really overweight and starting to wear caftans in his senior year, but no one called him gay or, uh, certainly they wouldn't have used that, but they didn't call him a fairy or queer or any of those things because he was just so outrageous. So much of your book is fueled because it was a time that it was before AIDS. Yeah. And it was before people really understood the harm of cocaine. That oh, it was, yeah, you, you know, so, and, and, and a lot of this story, isn't it, is fueled by the in, insatiable sex, the insatiable drugs. I mean, that, that led to his fall from power. Well, what happened, and we're kind of jumping ahead yes. to the yeah. Oscar disaster, but I think one of the reasons that Hollywood turned on him so fast is he used to have these little cameras in his disco, and I don't know. If you're in that disco, I looked up and I said, there, and the tables spun around, so obviously they were designed to do lines of coke. And I look up and I go, <laughs> there's a camera up there. <laughs> you know, so what these people, you know, and that fed into his TV set in his master bedroom. So people in Hollywood oh, would, you know, have all this sex and drugs, and he would have these, you know, private orgies kind of at four o'clock in the morning. I got a hold of the... DJ who would spin records for the major parties and also the orgies. Uh, and, you know, at four o'clock in the morning, you know, there would be Alan in one corner and Merv Griffin in another and Roy Cohn in another. And I can't tell you the politician and who make was Make sure in they're the all dead one. that you're yes. telling us. <laughs> the all these people are the dead. The living politician. The politician was in the fourth one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, you know, so these people were kind of afraid of Alan also because there he, you know, he had tapes of them having sex and doing cocaine and you're just like, these people must have been just completely whacked out 
that you would be doing this on camera because I walked into the the disco and like, oh, camera. There, there. Bob, let me ask you. Um, Alan Carr's kind of been, you know, uh, forgotten really for a long time. Mm -hmm. what, what got you thinking about doing a book on him? Um, you know, bringing him back to life, really. Well, I'd done this crazy book, The Man Who Invented Rock Hudson, which was about this gay agent, Henry Wilson, who lived out his sexual fantasy of creating Rock Hudson, Tab right. Hunter, Troy Donahue, Chad Everett. And around that time, I saw Tim Burton's movie, Ed Wood. And I actually kind of used Ed Wood as a template or inspiration that you can do a story about a real person whose life is so weird that if you wrote it as a novel, no one would accept it. Right. But you go, this happened. And Ed Wood, of course, is this guy who was straight, who was a transvestite who did the worst movies in the world. And uh, I was kind of looking with Henry Wilson, it really took us through the 30s, through the 60s, and what it was to be gay in Hollywood. So I was looking for something about the 70s. And the guys who wrote the screenplay to Ed Wood had also written a screenplay of The Village People. And that never got made. And I thought, oh, I'll do The Village People. It'll start in 77. But it's basically over with Can't Stop the Music in 1980, which ended their career. And then <laughs> which thought, Alan Carr produced. <laughs> which Alan Carr produced. Uh, and so I thought, oh, Alan. And, you know, I love that party animals of the 70s. And then I also love that in the 80s, he had La Cage of Folle, which was the first, you know, big you know, gay musical, gay musical that had same-sex lovers in it, which played out against the AIDS crisis and was uh, eventually closed prematurely, although it ran for four years because of the AIDS, cri the why, AIDS why, crisis. Why, why do you think it closed because of the AIDS crisis? Well, what happened was Rock Hudson died in October 1985, and I believe it was a Wednesday morning, and CBS or ABC had a camera crew in front of the Palace Theater these people walking out of having seen this frothy, you know, frothy Broadway musical and said, how do you feel about, you know, Rock Hudson, oh. a homosexual dying of AIDS, and you just saw a gay play? <laughs> and, and this was at a time when people thought, you know, you could get AIDS just by breathing the same air as a gay man. Absolutely. Yeah. And so the box office went down, and then two oh, years later... Oh, because I, I you thought know. your point was going to be that a significant n number of the members of the cast of La Cage of Fall died of AIDS, which was also the truth, that their, that their, their dancers well, were Fritz kind Well, Fritz Holt yeah. died, and who was the Fritz executive yeah, producer, man. and there was one of the Cajels who, who died very early in it. But it's intriguing about that, because in 1983, when the show opened, and I might be wrong about this, and it's just my interpretation, and, and I didn't go into it, but I, I didn't feel that the show was really embraced by the gay community, that I kept hearing about gay people going to see it and going like, oh, it's old Uncle Bruce, because it, was, <laughs> it wasn't based on the movie. In fact, that's a whole other controversy that they ran into trouble, that Mike Nichols, who was fired as the original director of the show, bought the rights to the movie, no and fool, Alan yeah. had only <laughs> bought the rights That's to right. the play. Right. So, you know, the, the, that, that created real, real complications. But I don't remember even in 83, but I guess to the general Broadway going, you know, world, AIDS in 1983, you know, still wasn't that big. It hadn't deal. registered. Uh, let's swing it back to Alan Carr. Um, what was his uh, childhood like? What got him going into show business? He, come, he came from a well-to-do uh, family, uh, I should say a well-to-do mother and father who were merchants in Chicago, and he lived in Highland Park, which was where, and his backyard was Lake Michigan. I mean, he mm -hmm. came from, from, from money. Mm -hmm. And they used to take him to Broadway almost every other week, his, his mother would, because his mother and father were divorced. So he, he really knew show business. And coming from Chicago, he loved Mike Todd, who had, and remember, Around the World in 80 Days, I think had its premiere in 55 or 56. And there was a big Madison Square party for that. Yeah. you know, where Mike Todd was the ringleader, and it was televised. Okay. And so that's the kind of party that Alan wanted to give for Can't Stop the Music, which was on the plaza of Lincoln Center. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a circus theme, and he was the ringmaster. And so that's what he was trying to uh, replicate. His, his parents had enough money to uh, start up or restart the Chicago Civic Theater, and he did give a season of plays, uh, Betty Davis and Gary Merrill, uh, came in in the world of Carl Sandburg and Ava Lagalian came in in something and this was funded by his his parents and he was just out of college. So he really uh, was a born producer. Presenter, he was a born promoter. and then he immediately started doing talent you know and he would have been 21 years old for uh, Hugh Hefner's uh, TV show, the first TV show which really kind of spawned the um, 
the the Playboy clubs. Yeah. So here was this gay guy, and I talked to Hugh Hefner about that, and he says, well, he, you know, got the talent and whatever, and, and you know, and they were, you know, big, uh, Hefner was definitely into, you know, big jazz names. So, you know, it, it, they, they were sizable names, and then he was, you know, this fairly successful producer in, uh, not producer, but manager in the 60s, which I don't go into much, because I really <laughs> was interested, of course, in the lurid aspect, so. <laughs> well, let me ask but you, what, was, was, the, was that hedonism, though, always there in him? Was he always with the drugs and the hustlers, or did that come along the more successful he got? Well, according to David Geffen and a number of other people, they thought he was a virgin throughout the 60s. Really? And then he was morbidly obese, and they think that in the 70s, he had one of the first bypass operations. And this is typical of Alan. Body by Dr. Rex whatever at a party. <laughs> You know, and he bragged about it, and he knew that the press would love him. I mean, he knew the quotes to feed to the press, mm. and so he really worked that. So he was just very, very high, high, high profile. Um, but you were saying you thought that the by how did the bypass then sort of play? Well, this? he lost weight. Uh -huh. I think he was embarrassed to have sex. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people thought that it was really kind of in 73, 74 that he lost his virginity or really started having a lot of sex. And also by then he had money. And so if and he a felt, coke habit, right? <laughs> yeah, and a coke habit. So if he felt that he wasn't attractive, he used to just walk up to guys, particularly when he made money on, on Greece and it was cash or career. Right. You know, that, that was his come on line. Really? <laughs> that's what he would career. say to yeah. cute boys? Cash or yeah. career? Mm -hmm. Can you name any of the boys who uh, opted for the for the career? <laughs> I'm sure there are lots. I'd also heard that he was a voyeur. You know that that was it. Well, that he the, really liked to watch. He had the he cameras liked to in watch the disco. cameras, and he also liked to watch young men wrestle. And you know, sometimes he would join them and mm. whatever. So his eye for talent, though, at that time, speaking of the young boys, was amazing. Well, that, John Travolta. And what? Mm -hmm. but, and first, one of his first clients was Anne Margaret. Mm -hmm. And he, but he had this amazing eye for sort of cheesy, tacky talent, which he was able to promote into becoming wonderful and mainstream, like John Travolta. John Travolta. Right? Mm -hmm. oh, not to cast aspersions at the present John Travolta, but John Travolta and Olivia Newton-John in Greece mm -hmm. was marvelously he had, tacky. He had to fight for Olivia Newton-John, too. Paramount really? did not want her. And uh, so that was... And also, he was very canny in that somehow, with the people who controlled Greece, he got them to sign the interpolation clause. So that's why you have all these songs written by Barry Gibb and John Farrar and Lewis the best Saint songs Lewis and, and Louis St. Louis and, and whatever, which are now part of the stage show. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it, it is kind of amazing with that. And, you know, to his credit, I mean, the original La Cage of Fold team was going to be Maury Yeston, right. uh, Jay Preston Allen. She wrote the book called The Queen and I, which turned into The Queen of Basin Street. Uh, and uh, Mike Nichols and Tommy Toon was going to choreograph it. And then that fell apart because it was too expensive a, pageant, uh, a package. And then he did put together the team with Fritz Holt and Barry Brown, I think, really put He brought in Jerry Herman and, and Arthur so, Lawrence and know. Harvey Fierstein, who yeah, that wrote the so. Lacage that we know. Mm -hmm. Just going back to Greece, though, I mean, that was the thing that sent him into the stratosphere. Mm -hmm. How did... How did that? How, how, how did he get that movie? How did he get those rights? How did he? What was his idea for that? It was Marvin Hamlish had told him, who was his client at the time, who had a chorus line then, mm -hmm. and said, "You've got to see Greece. It can be a movie." And he went to check into the rights, and Ralph Bakshi, who had done Ritz, Fritz the Cat, wanted to turn it into an animated feature. Huh. And then those rights lapped, and you know, in, and it was years. No one else had picked up Greece, and Alan was really the one who saw that through, and he also. Frankly, took Greece, you know, Pat Birch, who choreographed it, talked about this, that, you know, they lost the Chicago asphalt and, you know, all of a sudden it's palm trees. Yeah, it was a little musical out of Chicago in the first yeah, place. Yeah, you know, so this was, uh, you know, a Alan knew what middle America wanted, you know, with that. And he wanted Olivia Newton-John, but they had to change it from Sandy Dombrowski to Sandy Olson, which is from Australia. <laughs> yeah, which is Anne Margaret Olson. That's yes, where that that's name. Right. Came and he from. also wouldn't let the original creators on the set. No, he would not. <laughs> now we we, 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 go to the we got to touch on the Oscars, oh, because, the Oscars. because all right, here he comes. He's you know rolling from Greece, right? Mm -hmm. uh, La Cajo Falls, a big big hit in New York, mm -hmm. and he gets a chance, a dream for him to be the producer of the Oscars, yes. eight, eight, eighty nine mm -hmm. Oscars. Catastrophe. What what was the idea? What went wrong? And what happened to him afterward? 
Well, this is my interpretation that I think Hollywood was gunning for him because, number one, some people were a little bit afraid of him because of these tapes that he had, <laughs> uh, and he had too many stories to tell. Also, he was always the flamboyant Alan Carr. Even though he was openly gay, the press did not write about that. Even Vito Russo, who wrote Celluloid Closet, in a profile with The Advocate in 1980, does not <laughs> identify Alan Carr as being gay. I mean, that gives you an idea. <laughs> and he brought on Bruce Valanche, openly gay writer from the moment he stepped into the Hollywood Hills. Right. And he was going to write the whole show. And ABC got very nervous in the last week and brought on Hildy Parks, who, of course, written the Tony the Tonys, shows, yeah. to do this. And then also his other big hire at the beginning was that he was bringing Steve Silver, who directed Beach Bank at Babylon, which is still running in San Francisco, down to direct that notorious opening number with Snow White. Right. Okay, so you've got San Francisco flamboyant, openly gay. He was queen up the Oscars in a way, was he not? Yeah. It's an opening number where Snow White walks into the auditorium. It's you know, this, by this Army women, <laughs> you know, this this unknown actress, you know, dressed up as Snow White, and she goes, "How do I, you know, get to the Oscars?" And Army Archer said, "Follow the stars." And then she comes in and starts shaking the hands of Tom Hanks and Glenn Close and Michelle Pfeiffer, who are looking at this life-size cartoon character, completely aghast. Then she goes up on stage, and it's the Copacabana, not the Copacabana, the Coconut Grove, and Merv Griffin is singing, what a lovely bunch of coconuts. I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. coconuts right. Which he used to sing in the 40s, but the TV audience doesn't no, know it. that. It's just old Merv, pudgy Merv Griffin. And then there's all of these wax works of like Dale Evans and Roy Rogers and Vincent Price sitting around who can't really walk very well. And then it goes into a chorus line thing that's kind of out of Carmen Miranda. And, and Rob it, Lowe is Prince and Charming. And Rob Lowe, I forgot that, is, is Prince Charming. And he can't sing. And he's singing to Snow White, and, you know, Snow White has this squeaky voice. And then it goes into a replica of Grauman's Chinese Theater, and Lily Tomlin walks out and says, you know, welcome to the Oscars. Uh, that kind of campiness we deal with better today. But right, you know, back then, this was before the really success of people who deal in irony, you know, that kind of irony, like Tim Burton. And I actually think that if Snow White would have been Bette Midler, Everyone would have gone, oh, this is a gag, and this is supposed to be funny, and whatever. Well, he tried but, to get people like on well, the level Well, he tried to get Bette Midler to Lorna be Luff, at yeah. the very end. Yeah, but and Lorna Luff knew better than, yeah. you know, to go, <laughs> you know, in, into this world. You have to also remember, it's TV, and the, 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 the thing was 12 minutes long. The one thing that they learned about it, and... They were, Hollywood was so aghast about it that people like Blake Edwards, Julie Andrews, Paul Newman, Gregory Peck wrote a letter, like in essence, banning, you know, Alan Carr from ever doing the Oscars again. And also then Disney sued for copyright infringement on Snow White. Yes, because it's wonderful they forgot to ask Disney if, if it was okay use to Snow use White. Snow White. <laughs> well, there, there, there's controversy about what Disney knew. Oh, so interesting. So there's kind of, you know, that, you know, and, and also these were open rehearsals. Yeah. And there were photographs taken by AP and the LA Times. So if you ever see anything of that that can be reprinted, these were photographs that were taken in so it wasn't yes, a big we, secret. But what's so interesting is that Bruce Valanche, yeah. who we love beyond yeah. all measure here at Theatre Talk, yeah. has gone on to write many wonderful Oscar programs. And the whole show, Steve Silver just directed the opening 12 minutes, and at one point he was saying, this is 12 minutes, it, it's way too long, and Alan said, step aside, you've already got a job in San Francisco, this is my next mm. job. Alan thought that this, he was going to produce the Oscars forever. And so that we have the 10 minutes for this, Alan Carr started the whole red carpet mania that we have today. And Alan said, hey, let's do five or 10 minutes of red carpet coverage. Now the red carpet it's coverage longer than the Oscars for themselves. the Grammys, the Emmys, you yes, know, the, the Golden Globes innovative. has taken over. This is a billion dollar a year business. And Alan hired Fred um, Heyman from Rodeo Drive, you know, very famous realtor, you know, to get designers to land the their designs you know Halston and Giorgio Santangelo to the actresses and they were very reluctant to do it so all of that fashion Oscar award stuff started with Alan Carr he is the one and this is on the Tonys the Tony goes to it used to be and the winner goes to Alan said no it's going to be and the Tony the and the Oscar goes to mm. uh, and he really upped it and the ratings went through the roof that year they had been on a five-year decline 
ended it. But what happened is the next day, Disney sued. There was this petition of 17 people from Paul Newman to Fred Zinnemann, you know, essentially banning, you know, Alan Carr from the Oscars. The Oscars then had a commission to see what went wrong. And one of the big <laughs> things they decided is that an opening number should only be three minutes. In fact, any number should only be three well, minutes. Well, I think that's a good ruling. Yeah. But this was the end for Alan Carr. I mean, he lived another 10, ten years, years or so, but years. there was no career after this Oscar fiasco. His health was never good, but I think he, he ran on cocaine and adrenaline, and he yeah. was just this bundle of energy, always, always. And he became a recluse for two years, and he did not show his face at a Hollywood function until Angie Dickinson appeared on the AFI tribute to, I think, Kirk Douglas, and said, you're going to be my date. No, I don't want to go. And she says, yes, you are. And that introduced him to Hollywood again. But what was really sad is that Alan showed up at Morton's restaurant the next day, and no one in the restaurant would speak to him. The day after the Oscars. Yeah. Mm. Really? Just, I mean, the, what a brutal town. No, one really day he's was. on top, and the next day, that's it. Over, yeah. finish. Mm -hmm. huh. Sad. Uh, well, listen, the book is, is terrific. I mean, it's a great story of a man's life, but also a wonderful um, uh, slice of Hollywood and the hedonistic, uh, <laughs> hedonistic days. Party Animals, a Hollywood tale of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, starring the fabulous Alan Carr. You'll wish you were there. You'll wish you were there. Dancing for Alan Carr's cameras. Uh, by uh, uh, Bob Hoffler from Variety. Thanks a lot for being our guest. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Thanks, Bob. You can sign up for viewer updates at theatertalk.org. Or you can Twitter us. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night.